Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our second webinar in our series titled Leadership Conversations on COVID-19 and the Public Trust. My name is Michael DeWild. I direct the CUSI Business Ethics Initiative at the Seidman College of Business and teach in the management department there. Our title today is Reimagining Capitalism for the 21st Century, and I'm joined by two distinguished guests whose work and character I admire. Fred Keller, founder of Cascade Engineering, driving force behind Talent 2025, and many other social innovations and uh, enterprises. And Dr. Jerry Davis from the University of Michigan, the Ross School there, whose latest book is called The Vanishing Corporation. Um, Fred, Jerry, thanks for joining us. Fred, Fred is thanks joining us from us. Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and Jerry's in the middle of Detroit, uh, in case you're not sure about the background there. So both we all are familiar with some of the expressed disillusionment with the United States style capitalism. I suppose you could point to the success of Bernie Sanders and his campaign. You could look at recent polls talking about uh, at least some younger constituencies favoring or say, saying that they favor socialism over capitalism. Fred, let me start with you. Um, do you share any of that disillusionment with US style capitalism? And if so, where does one begin to begin to reimagine it? Well, thank you, Michael. Thanks for organizing this. And it's really an honor to be here with Jerry, who I admire very much and have gotten to know a little bit at, uh, at the Ross School. Um, you know, we've had a, a fairly good run at uh, practicing capitalism uh, for the last uh, 75 years since the close of the Second World War. It's kind of been uh, a, a time when we all thought that uh, capitalism would do that which kind of President Kennedy uh, 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 promised us back then. He, he said, a rising tide floats all boats. And we expected that that would actually be the case. Um, you know, the, the COVID uh, experience has really um, ripped the veneer off of some of our thoughts about capitalism. And we really are, are exposing this idea that, that uh, Perhaps it's not working as well for quite a few folks. So I'd like to show you a couple of slides that would uh, indicate that, uh, that situation. If you could put them up. Now, this is a slide uh, that uh, goes back to the 60s and shows the earning power of folks um, in, the, oops, I'm gonna go back up to that one. And it should be animated, but it's supposed to, it's supposed to be animating itself, but it's not. But uh, if this were animating, you would see from the, oh, uh, there we go, uh, uh, from the 60s uh, to uh, uh, the, the 2000s, uh, this has worked pretty well for the folks at the top, the top 10th percentile, even the top uh, 20, 50, uh, 20, 15, 20 percentile. The middle has gained some, but uh, as you'll note in the, in the lower ends, that's actually declined in, uh, in earning power. Uh, over the over the decades, so it, this really is uh, in terms of financial uh, progress. It isn't exactly what we would have had, have imagined. We might have imagined a slope that would be uh, continuing up for all areas, uh, but there's a, uh, a another element to this uh, that um, I want to just go to the next slide. Uh, that that uh, also there's a, there's kind of a myth about uh, poverty. Uh, we, we think of poverty as being a de minimis uh, kind of percentage, somewhere between 10 and 15% of the population is in poverty. It looks like it's a fairly stable thing. It's going to be with us forever. Uh, but I wanted to uh, just bring to light uh, why and how we define poverty and, and why that's uh, perhaps not a very good argument to think that poverty is a small percentage of the population. Um, Back in 1965, when uh, uh, President Lyndon Johnson took over, uh, he declared a war on poverty and he wanted to figure out how to uh, measure it. And they sent a, a bunch of folks looking for some way to measure it. And they found this uh, rather obscure uh, 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 person working in, in the Department of Commerce, uh, Molly Orshansky. And she had written a paper that said when, when people are really poor, they can spend as much as a third of their income on, on, on food. 
And they said, that's it. That's how we'll, how we'll measure poverty. We'll figure out what it costs for food for people to feed themselves and we'll multiply it by three. And that'll be the defining uh, measure for poverty. Well, guess what? We still do it, we still figure it that way. Uh, the, oops, I'm sorry, go back to the next one. Um, when you measure it in a, in a way when people are employed, there are lots of things that need to be considered, and this is a list of them. It shows on the left-hand side a basic survival budget for folks that are in poverty. And uh, then on the right-hand side, that compares to what the measurement for poverty would be. And if you look at that, it's, it's roughly uh, double the earnings required. No savings, no educational uh, set-asides, just surviving in, in, uh, with their budget. And interestingly enough, uh, the, the, the number of folks who are able to do that, uh, and now I'm going to have to go to get the next slide. Um, the, the number of people who are able to meet that standard of a minimum survival budget is uh, the, the people who can't make it, who are, are, are below that minimum budget, is 41% in all of Michigan. Uh, West Michigan, you know, gets a little bit better in some cases, 39% uh, on average, but there are some, some counties that are worse. And the fact is that we've got uh, a, a, a system that is not just in Michigan that's causing this, but as you look across the states, the number is dramatically higher than the official poverty rate. And so with that, I, I just think that we've got to say that, that uh, you know, Capitalism has been great for the world. There's no question about it. And the idea that we have been able to have, and the, the common phrase is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's lifted more people out of poverty than any other system. Totally agree. But it doesn't mean that we can't think about, you know, as, the question I guess for ourselves is, what do we want to have for the future? What kind of capitalism results do we want to have for the future? And we can talk about some of the causes of that in our conversation, but uh, the point is that I think it sets the stage that says capitalism is, is a great thing. There's no question. Market, using markets to make things happen. I'm a capitalist. But how we practice capitalism is the real opportunity facing us today. Right, thanks, Fred. So let me ask you to, to, to weigh in, Jerry. Would you agree that capitalism is a great thing in the way that Fred has defended it? So because I'm a college professor, I have to split rather than lump things. Uh, so I never want to disagree with Fred uh, or you because you're both uh, so wise and I always love uh, engaging with the a Seedman audience. Um, but when we talk about capitalism, we talk as if it's one thing, but the world is full of really different flavors of capitalism. Uh, UK capitalism, Denmark capitalism, Brazil, China, they're all really different systems. So when we say capitalism has lifted so many people out of poverty, we do have to keep in mind that the biggest chunk of those people live in China, which technically is a communist dictatorship. Um, they do use markets, but it's a different flavor of capitalism uh, than the US has. So there's really different flavors. I wanna highlight that the US is a really different system from the rest of the world. We got two ways in which we're really distinctive. One is that since the start of the 20th century, uh, the central pillars of the American economy have been large scale, vertically integrated, publicly traded corporations. And since the 1980s, there's been this widely shared understanding that the ultimate purpose of these corporations is to create shareholder value typically understood as maximizing share price. So that's one distinctive thing, share price as the central sort of number to watch in the American economy. The second thing is that after World War II, most advanced economies created a social welfare system in which it was the government's job to provide health insurance and pension security in old age. The US is the one weird outlier. We took a left turn when everybody else turned right a big burden uh, on big employers uh, to make those things work. Both of these understandings, the idea that corporations exist for shareholders and that employers are the right ones to provide health care and pensions now seem really problematic for a lot of different reasons. And I think COVID highlights, people say they prefer socialism to capitalism. What they really mean is they want a more humane version of a market economy. I don't think anybody says, yay, I want to live in Venezuela, or let's bring back the Soviet Union. That, I don't hear that from, uh, from a lot of people. Um, 
But the thing is that in the U.S., if you don't have paid sick leave, bankruptcy, because you go to the hospital to get better. We all want the guy at Kroger or the lady that the, the, the UPS place to be healthy and to keep us healthy. But in the U.S., that's not really the situation for a lot of people because of the way we provide benefits. Uh, it's just an individual choice people around you. So we are interdependent. Um, now, how does competitive capitalism deal with this problem? And I had a thought experiment that I shared with Fred and Michael that I still kind of like. So consider this thought experiment. Imagine, uh, like Fred, you run a business and found a way to keep your people incentives to share your innovation. So reflect on that. As a business owner, do you have any reason to go out of your way to share your idea? Now, let's amp it up a little bit. Suppose that you, your proprietary innovation becomes a competitive advantage. The best interest to hoard that information to prevent your competitors from copying it. I think that's a pretty tough question. If the answer to those is, yep, hang on to that proprietary innovation, we should be anxious about that. And at a larger level, I think it suggests that there's a pretty crucial role for government, that governments really are, if I start the slides, I just want to share two informative. So the picture is showing the proportion of the labor force in the United States working in manufacturing uh, retail and at the federal government. And you see that manufacturing, since a blip in the Second World War, uh, the proportion of people working in manufacturing has been on this basically steady, gently downward, such as uh, where we are now. You notice it's a little subtle, but the high point of federal government employment after the, the end of the Second World War was in the early 1950s at about 5%. That number has been going down continuously, and it's about 2% right now. So if anybody ever says to you the federal government is exploding in size out of control, you are welcome to punch them in the kidney. That is not true. Uh, at least in terms of employment, federal government employment has been, uh, here's an updated figure for uh, more recent times. Yep. This is uh, the uh, number of employees in uh, the federal government manufacturing, retail and food service every year from 2010 to 2020 uh, measured in April. So it's measured April of every year over the last, see what's happened in the last month. And so retail employment has dropped by about 2 million people. But look at that orange line, food service. The number of people employed in restaurants and other food service establishments dropped by half in a month from 12 million to 6 million. And in the American context, that might mean they've all lost health insurance uh, and they probably lost wages. That's six million people suddenly on the street. Whose job is it to take care of them? I'd want to suggest that we want a system where those people are taken care of um, and that we sort of haven't done that as well as we should currently. So that's what I got. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Fred, do you want to respond to any of that, especially as a business owner who was uh, responsible for for healthcare and maybe a somewhat larger let me put it on the table now i don't know that you and jerry shane share the same uh, perception of the role of government i don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit if, unless i've misunderstood you over the years you're you want to put business front and center you think business has the tools and the the opportunity if not the responsibility to in fact pick up uh, some of these communal and statewide responsibilities? Well, I, th I think that there's, uh, there's certainly this, this uh, uh, need for uh, a, a central government to do uh, infrastructure and to make sure people are safe and all those things that, that we expect a government to do. I just think the ideas for how that gets done uh, should come from the private sector. I think that the, uh, the, 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 the ones who are practicing it right now are the ones who really should be informing policy uh, and, and in doing it in a way which would be uh, providing experiences. I, th I, I, I fundamentally believe that we need to do this in communities and that the communities are the, 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 uh, the, the unit of change uh, for the future as opposed to trying to design some grand experiment that we go to the federal government with to uh, be able to say, if we do this, everything will be fine. We've got this, this, this uh, kind of narrative going on right, right now in the country that if we only had the right governor or the right president, uh, everything would be fine. Uh, and, and usually that's defined by the person saying that or feeling it because they want the person elected to be able to take care of them. 
And what we really need is, is a, a collective idea as to how to make these things happen. And the test bed for that is in community. So that, I'd start with that. Um, and and in, in terms of uh, Jerry's thought experiment, uh, if, if you as a, if, if I as a business owner have something that's going to be useful for the, uh, the common good, uh, I'd be derelict if I didn't want to share that in some way. Now, I would also say that in order to make that concept work, it may need a business model to be able to make sure that it doesn't take uh, funding forever to make it work from some outside source. So you might want to, uh, you know, the ideal is you come up with these wonderful ideas that, uh, that, that create a sustaining uh, uh, source of income for that, uh, for that wonderful idea that's going to be solving problems for the world. I wonder if we could drill down on that a little bit. So Fred, so suppose you've come up with this ingenious operations research way to keep people, uh, keep people healthy at, at a cast aid engineering facility. Um, uh, would you agree that there is not built in an incentive to share that, um, other than you said common decency? But imagine we live in a, an economy that measures things in dollars and cents. Uh, suppose I'm not decent. Do I have a reason to uh, to share? Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, there, there's a, there's this interesting concept of self-interest and uh, altruism, and and for many people they will argue that as you know uh, we've we've had this discussion. But if if you have a uh, someone who is uh, 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 talking about altruism and they say that's really important, that's number one. Somebody else will say, well, that's fine. That's, that's in your own self-interest. You get, you get uh, joy out of, out of being altruistic. And, and the, uh, the, for me, that's much more nuanced. I, I think that we don't want to, it isn't an either or, it's a both. And we need to be able to think in terms of what's good for, for society, what's good for the world, and also what's good for the business, what's good for, for us personally. And, and I think that's the, I think that's the nuance we, we, we could imagine could be really quite a bit better than where we, where we are now. Because everybody talks about, the, you know, well, business will, will like this if it gives them a return. Well, okay, that, that's one thing, that's true, but it's also business will like it if it's, it can make an impact. Jerry, can you speak to the government question a little more as well? You mentioned different styles and kinds of capitalism, referencing Denmark and, you know, maybe people misunderstanding what's going on in Scandinavia or Northern Europe as socialism as opposed to, as you said, capitalism with a, a much greater social safety net than we tend to have here. In, in light of Fred's comments and the role of government, um, would you be confident about a, a bottom-up communal approach to that? Or when you look at those other systems, do you think, you know, there's no reason some of that kind of top-down approach couldn't be applied here? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, Denmark always stands out as this interesting example, because if you go to Denmark and say, show me your socialism, they'd say, well, we're not socialist. We just have a healthcare system, but they, um, they don't particularly... Uh, they don't talk about socialism very much in Denmark. They just have a safety net that makes a lot of sense at a collective level. And it is a very entrepreneurial uh, country. Uh, one of the things that you can do if everyone uh, has basically a financial safety net and access to healthcare is I can start a business. And in the US, you're a bold risk taker if you start a business, but if it fails, you might end up living in your car and the people that work for you are living in their car too. I would not wanna be the CEO of a company uh, right now thinking about how am I going to make my payroll? All those people are depending on me because, you know, where do they go if the customers evaporate and I have to send them home? This is a terrible time to be a, to, to be a business person, uh, especially an ethical business person thinking about sort of all, all of the burdens that they're facing. The thing is that in the Danish situation, if you go out of business and your workers are unemployed and they get 80% of their uh, of their wages restored, and they still have health insurance. And so it's a, you can be a bold risk taker and start a business. And if it fails, it doesn't mean your family has to live on the street. It means you move on to the next thing. The risk is in the domain of business and not you know, the, your, your family's livelihood. And so in some sense, business, Denmark is a very 
business friendly place. But as you said, it has fewer than 6 million people there. So Denmark would be a small state in the US and they might have a bit more of that sense of, uh, of fellow feeling. You know, Fred pointed to the importance of community. And I have no doubt that if, if uh, Fred had generated an ingenious way to keep workers safe, the next day he would announce to his CEO friends in, in, uh, in Grand Rapids, here's a great way to keep your people safe. And I, I have no doubt that it would spread at the community because you all know each other, you see each other, you go to events. There is that sort of fellow feeling within that commutable distance that it's a lot easier to visualize a positive social impact. That's harder for a country of 330 million people. And, and let me give voice to maybe some typical American concerns around what you're saying. And I, I hear them certainly in my classes from time to time. And that is, well, that might work for, you know, those folks, those funny Europeans. But, you know, part of the uh, perhaps intended or unintended consequence of that kind of large social safety net is you, you, ebb, uh, you, you erode people's freedoms There's a, or, or at the very least incentives. One of the great things about this country and the free market is, sure, you might fail hugely, but you also have the opportunity to, to succeed uh, hugely. And you know, to go back to where we started in, term, in terms of Fred's you know, Alice comparison, I, mean, I, I don't have to imagine this because I've heard people say it. Well, that's a failing. You know, you've got every opportunity in this country to succeed. And I don't recognize a particular obligation, either on my own or through the government, to support people who haven't taken advantage of the opportunities of living. So you get my question, right? Which is the, um, the freedom to fail is something that people want to preserve, if, you, if that's right. Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a, a, a fair question. Uh, let's put it in the context of COVID. So um, I would like the people that I encounter on the street, at the grocery store, uh, delivering food to my house, working in the kitchens, at the restaurants, if I ever manage to go back to a restaurant again, I want them all to feel safe. And I want them all to say, if I start to feel sick, I'm going to stay home from work and not sneeze on Jerry's dinner. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, it is, it's great to have freedom to, to achieve things, but we are all interdependent, like it or not. If anybody's sick, we're all at risk. So we all have a common interest and making sure that the floor is not too low. You know, we, we all want to have a safety net because we all lose when somebody gets on the elevator and sneezes all over us. So we all want everyone to be healthy. And this seems to really call that uh, question. Um, I mean, and it is the case that it's great to have the opportunity to succeed and also the, the exciting opportunity to fail. And a swimming pool is fun but jumping out of the second floor to dive into the swimming pool, you know, that is a bold risk taker, but it's kind of a moronic risk. You don't want the risk that people are taking when they innovate to be catastrophic. Um, you don't want the risk for starting a business to be, and if this fails, I move back in with my parents um, or live on the street. Uh, people don't really choose uh, necessarily their own circumstances in ways that make that, uh, that, that fable about sort of pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps work well. Fred, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh... Well, I mean, the uh, if, we're, if we're talking about reimagining capitalism and how it might work for us better, um, it, it really, in my mind, is a matter of how we practice it. And it, and it also is a matter of, um, of, of having the right elements uh, throughout the, the system. Now, the system of capitalism takes... Uh, it takes uh, consumers, it takes investors, it takes business leaders, and it takes employees. And, and the, uh, when those start aligning in the direction of uh, wanting and desiring uh, a different result from capitalism, uh, I, I believe that we will have a better response to the situation that we've got uh, with COVID facing us today. It certainly is enhanced by the government uh, uh, policies. And I'll give you an example from the Europeans. They have uh, 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 instituted in their system of, of unemployment when they run into a catastrophe like this, they pay, as Jerry mentioned, they pay their, the, the employers to keep the folks on the job. They pay up to 80% 
of their wages just as, uh, so that they don't have to go on the street. We choose to do differently. We choose to put people on the street and then pay them from the government. Uh, I think it's a, th there's a policy change that could really make a huge difference in how businesses are able to respond to this situation. Uh, but the, that's, uh, that, that's, that's where policy comes in. But reimagining capitalism uh, really takes uh, uh, those four components and they need to be working together toward a, a desired future state that they all can imagine. I think we're making our way slowly towards that. Uh, we have more and more uh, students entering the workforce that are saying things like, you know, I wanna work for a, a company that, uh, that does something more than just make a lot of money for their shareholders. I wanna work for a company that, that uh, is an upstanding, uh, uh, a positive impact uh, company, a company with purpose beyond just uh, shareholder value. Uh, you've got investors, you've got the impact investing world is growing. Uh, it, is, it is not something that is mainstream by a long shot, but it is growing. People want to make an impact with their money as well as make a return. Now there's the argument about how much, you know, do, do you balance that? Is it, what, it, does it have to be market rates? All that sort of thing. But the point is that we are in fact uh, moving towards impact investing. There are more and more business leaders, including very important business leaders, that are, are making a statement with their businesses about what they, what, how they can conduct business. So they're attracting consumers that want to align with that. That system is a positive race to the top system. And we need to have more and more of that happening if we're gonna really reimagine capitalism. But it starts with a, an Im image of what capitalism could do for us in the ideal state. And you're talking about at least relative to government regulation or incentives, a bottom-up system, even if it's a CEO making a decision. Is there a role for wise government in terms of incentivizing those kinds of movements even more than they have so far? Yes, and, and, and yet it's dangerous territory. Uh, we, we, we need to be able to make sure that we don't, um, uh, destroy the unintended consequences of incentives our, our, um, our legion. And uh, we've, we've got uh, certain incentives we've done, been doing for a long time with uh, capital investments, for instance, and so on. So I think they have to be, have to be careful about it. But I, I think it's, it's important to have uh, government working hand in hand with business to be able to get towards that more ideal state. And, and Jerry, you mentioned that you are an advocate for free markets and yet, you know, also have ideas about how capitalism, U.S. style capitalism might be reimagined. Can you, you want to lay out your vision? Yeah, well, I think um, I showed you that chart showing what's gone on in the last two months and 50% of the jobs in food service evaporating. That's going to be really hard to get back to work. I think it's going to be a good while before people are able to get back to work. Uh, I would say workplace safety makes it clear that we're going to be distancing for many months to come. So just thinking ahead right now to how can we all get back to work in the next um, six months, let's say, um, clearly there's going to be a role for government in intermediating this because it's a big collective action to keep everyone safe. But it feels to me that there's a few things where now is the right time to think about policy choices that make it easier for businesses to behave themselves. Um, so how about a four day work week or a 30 hour work week uh, where we stagger shifts and we have fewer people on the floor at any given time, um, but we work a little less, we make a little bit less money, but we don't have staggering levels of unemployment. How about that for a start? 30 hour work week uh, with staggered shifts and allowing people to work from home uh, whenever it's possible. One of the things that I've been enjoying, not enjoying, but of learning uh, working from home is just how much it's possible for people to do crazy multitasking. I think we've all been on Zoom calls where people are also feeding the baby, walking the dog and so on. So it feels like we're in this interesting experimental time. Can we think about business policies supported by government or enabled by government uh, that make the workplace a bit more humane and family friendly on the way back in. I think all of us love the fact that air is cleaner and that we're not spending as much time commuting by car. Um, can we build on that? Can we think about sort of a different form of workplace when we come back 
uh, and uh, where, where the, the potentially catastrophic levels of unemployment uh, are eased a bit by having more humane uh, work life. I, for one, would love the four-day work week. I got to say, it's probably just me. Maybe there's others. But I'm willing to trade off a bit if that becomes, uh, uh, becomes the norm. Fred, what about those? Well, um, as a manufacturer, it, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to figure out how you're going to get the same amount of work out uh, uh, with, in a four-day time. Uh, so it's, uh, it's difficult to imagine how that might work. And also, I, I, I suppose you're proposing that they, the pay would be the same for folks uh, 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 taking home. So they'd have to uh, be able to have a, a pretty big, uh, what, a 30% uh, or so increase in their uh, or twenty percent increase in their in their wages in order to be able to uh, have the same take home pay in the in the four day week work week. Um, I'm open to negotiation on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, those are the challenges, the practical challenges we have with that sort of a thing. And and it's uh, but the 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 notion and and, and business is um, uh, uh, certainly in the manufacturing world is decidedly un, um, unpredictable. And uh, it's difficult to be able to say that we'll need exactly 30 hours every week. We may need uh, 50 or 60 hours some weeks. Uh, but the, um, uh, those notions of, of having a, um, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that it's, it's all related to the number of hours worked per, per week. Um, uh, because, uh, the, you know, if you're, if you're working 30 hours, does that make you happier? Maybe you've got some data on that. Uh, Jerry, I, I wonder if there is, uh, but the, uh, the, the, the idea that you hate to go to work and you love to be home, my ideal is you love to be at work because it's such a wonderful place to be. Um, well, if I worked at Cascade Engineering, I would also feel that way because every day is a, is a delight uh, uh, full of warmth and family. Um, one of the things that we're gonna be wrestling with though uh, is getting childcare back online because uh, it's really clear that the return to work is uh, the, the, the disappearance from work is at very disparate impact. Whoever it is in the household that's doing the most child care is bearing the biggest burdens. And yeah. it's, there's certainly some data to suggest that is not being shared equally by all the major genders. Um, when we go back to work, if daycare, just think what it's going to take to get daycare back online uh, at the scale that we need it. Like if right. you've ever spent time among, uh, among children aged two to four, their standard greeting is to put their fingers in their mouth and then stick it in the other kid's eyes. That's just the way they all interact. That's just a giant Petri dish that's efficiently designed to spread disease. Well, that's going to take some real rethinking, and it's not going to happen overnight. And suppose you're on the finance committee of your daycare center, and you say, the only way we're going to get back to work is one-third as many kids uh, Purell on every table and kids wearing hazmat suits all day, um, that is going to be a real expense. So it's reasonable to expect daycare is not going to decide how much they can play Animal Crossing. <laughs> uh, and so I think we're going to have to make accommodations if we expect to have a next generation of kids. I mean, we could also go in the other direction and say, too bad for you. You're a sucker and shouldn't have had children, and that's capitalism. Um, you should live with your kids in the car and then come into work, or I don't know what the, <laughs> what the answer is there, but you know, in a, in a humane society, we need a next generation. And so we have to make accommodations. So shorter work hours seems like the most straightforward way to address how do we get back to work safely and to do so in a world where, where daycare is going to be tricky and in a way that's just, just not just radically inequitable uh, for, uh, for different genders. Michael, maybe this is the place where we can in introduce the idea of externalities. Uh, sure. Do you mind if I also put one other question on the table before sure. you, you go there, however you want to? And I raised this with some foreboding, but it feels like it's an honest question that needs to be addressed. Jerry mentioned earlier, so maybe I'll ask you to put on your sociologist hat, that perhaps it's easier in places that have a quote-unquote more humane or larger social safety net that the levels of, um, that they're more homogenous than, than populations here. So we're reading around the edges of COVID-19 that, you know, effects are being felt differently in different kinds of communities, Black and Latino communities being harder hit, especially. Um, to get to the more humane capitalism that you're, you're referencing, is that a prerequisite that we 
continue or, or address yet again some of the uh, racial inequities in the country? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, uh, and it's a really tough question because it's pretty clear that it's uh, endemic to the system that we have, that the effects are always going to be uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, diverse across different populations. Uh, one of the things that uh, the study of uh, social welfare policies in the U.S. has shown is that the only social welfare policies that stick are the ones that don't have... Uh, disparate impacts that everyone avails themselves of. So everyone loves social security because everyone collects it. So Fred might be a billionaire, but he can still cash uh, social security checks. It's not contingent on that. If you worked, you get social security. And so the, the, uh, um, the, the policies that are most stable, most politically uncontroversial are the ones that are uh, common to everyone. And so we might like that things were otherwise, and we might think it would be better to have uh, disparate policies depending on sort of the impacts that you're facing. Uh, it's pretty tricky to do that in a way that's politically sustainable. Um, so Fred, let me throw it back to you. And <clears throat> if you had things you want to you want to begin with on the externalities, go ahead. But if you also want to take up the, the racial question, <clears throat> I know Cascade obviously has done a lot of work in that area, but that's something that you want to address as well. Well, I, I think that's, uh, again, I, th I think we have this, we shouldn't think of it as an either or, that, that uh, we're going to have racial policy figured out at the, at the policy level or we're going to have it figured out in the, in the business level. Um, I, I believe it's a both and. Uh, I do believe that business has a huge role to play in this. <clears throat> it's, um, it, it's, it is in, in some respects, it's a uh, it's an altruistic uh, uh, a feeling that we have that, that says, that, you know, we're all in this together. We're, we're all humans and we all need to be able to uh, uh, support each other. Uh, but it's also in our own self-interest. We need to be able to have uh, the best talent from wherever that talent may be lying uh, and, and, and be able to have the, uh, the, the kind of environment where people feel and, and, and know that they are valued uh, as a human being. And the, to the extent that we can do that well in the business world is the extent to which we'll uh, uh, reduce the needs for, for additional policy. But that, it really, it, 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 they, they work together. And I, I, I think we, to, to, to wait for, for policy to come in before we take action is irresponsible for business. And, it's, and, and uh, likewise, I think if, if, if the government says, well, "Well, we'll we'll follow whatever somebody else does." That's irresponsible as well. It needs to be it needs to be uh, coordinated. It needs to be together. But let me deal with a little bit with externalities because, as a result of what we do practicing capitalism today, we do have unintended consequences that impact the world negatively. And and um, if if we are if, if you know the common examples of that might be pollution, for instance. Um, and and there are there are now you have regulations then that come in place that that minute, you know put a put a cap on the amount that you can possibly do, but there are other organizations that are the business in the business world that are, are taking it on much further. A great example is is uh, Patagonia. They they've taken on the idea that they they discovered that that uh, you know using cotton raised in the traditional ways is just terrible uh, to for the land. And they've decided to go with all organic cotton. Well, it sounds like a pretty benign thing, but actually it's a pretty big deal and it impacts the whole supply chain, not only in this country, but in other countries. And, and that's an example of, of how, and, and the product costs a little bit, that's where these things start breaking down. I'll just, I'll just go with the cheapest, uh, thanks very much. And so, so if we were able to have that informed policy that says, no, it's possible to price those things in, then we could actually have uh, capitalism working for all. If we could understand what the externalities are, what the, what the unintended consequences are, and price those into our products, then as, as that product sold more, it would be uh, uh, providing uh, more relief. So I, I have to ask you the question that I've asked you before that I, I know you find irritating, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. <laughs> and that is, if that's the right thing to do, and if it's clear, that it's the right thing to do. Why not make that a top-down 
government regulation as opposed to waiting for your fellow CEOs to finally get with the program. Well, I actually, as you know, I kicked this back to the, to the business schools because the research hasn't been done. I mean, we, can tr we could trust the, uh, the government to do the research perhaps, but we don't know all the externalities. We don't know how, how to price them into the products. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we, we, we need to be able to have that research done so we can do it effectively. There's a ton of externalities, and some are easy to price in, others are tougher. But let's understand what they are and then put them in there, and then we'll make it work. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't have no taxes. Uh, there, you know, the European models have, have tended to go the other way, as Jerry pointed out. What's the, what's the, the tax in Denmark? It's pretty high, I suspect. Oh, over 50%. They have a lot of taxes, yeah. They have a lot of taxes. Um, but so they, t they tend to deal with these externalities uh, through government programs. I, I think that's interesting, but it's not how, it's, it's, it's not as close to the American ideal of capitalism that we might want. And we want to be able to have, I, th I think a hybrid approach is, is, is very worthwhile. I think we can go a lot farther without imposing taxes. Now prices may go up, but that's, that's a, that's a, we're going to have a whole lot better society if we, if we get at it from the, if we, figure out how to price those externalities in. So Jerry, it's, uh, it's the University of Michigan's fault. You haven't done enough research <laughs> on, on this. So, right. so what have you got? Well, I think the state legislature needs to send us more money and we will get right on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I, uh, I, I always love uh, hearing Fred's perspective on this and uh, because he's a cockeyed optimist, he goes straight to Patagonia, making the world a better place. Because I'm a sullen, uh, dark loner, I go straight to Purdue Pharmaceuticals uh, or Juul uh, or Coca-Cola, uh, businesses that make their money by creating externalities. So Purdue Pharmaceutical is wildly profitable because it sells an addictive substance to people in bulk. And states pay the externalities. The families of people that become addicted to their products uh, pay the externalities. Um, and it's a very profitable model. There's something wrong if you can make that much money uh, by, by addicting people. And I would say the same thing is true for Juul. This is kind of a, a, a traumatic. If you don't have any kids under, under 20, you might be unfamiliar with this product. Two students at the Stanford Design School who are cigarette smokers uh, decided they wanted to create something that would make it easier for adults to quit smoking. And so they came up with an electronic cigarette that ultimately evolved into the Juul. But once it got into a shareholder-owned corporation, it was really clear that this thing was very addictive, and that the perfect market for it is children in junior high school and high school, especially if you had bubblegum flavored, mango flavored, uh, you know, and marketed to childhood influencers. Now, we had eliminated smoking in the United States for people under 20. It was like a vanishingly small number of people smoked. Now we have a new generation of nicotine addicts uh, because of the business model of Juul. Um, something's gone. There's got to be a role for an authority. Uh, there's got to be some uh, greater morality that comes to bear on that when the business model is one that has such terrifying public health consequences in the end. And with, with that in mind, let me try to summarize uh, a couple of questions that I've gotten. We've got about five minutes or so left. And one of them is along the lines of, well, two of them I'm conflating here. It strikes these listeners anyway that the, the way American style capitalism is practiced, there, it's hard to get around the, the, the profit motive. But that really is what's taught in business schools. It really is why people get into business and that the incentive around profit just makes it very difficult to achieve the kind of community or community mindedness that you're talking about. So that's the question. The subset of that is, is that the role then for NGOs and nonprofits to kind of fill the gap to be a, to mediate between a kind of, you know, hardcore American style capitalism and the, the, um, the perhaps unwitting consumer as Jerry, you were just talking about. Uh, Fred, you first. Well, uh, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, no, I, I think um, there, there's definitely a role for, for NGOs, but the thing is, um, in the United States, we think it's the role of nonprofits to do a lot of things that are done by the government elsewhere. 
elsewhere in the world. If you want to feed people very large scale, it's to take that to the whims of charity to take care of basic uh, social needs. And I'm not sure that NGOs will help the uh, um, the 12 year old that starts smoking Juul because their friends think it's cool or they learned about it on social media. I'm just not sure how how they would be able to protect you. They don't really have the authority uh, to, to be able to do that. So. Want to rephrase the question, uh, um, Michael? After after that, I agree with what Jerry's saying in general. Okay, well, we've got a couple of minutes left then. Um, maybe last words on reimagining reimagining capitalism in terms of takeaways. Um, you know, you, one of the things that you talked about is the differing roles of private sector uh, versus potential of government intervention and bottom up or community or any kind of localism. In terms of getting people back to work, giving people a purpose again, um, is that largely going to be a, a local obligation or response? Can, can a kind of localism emerge out of this? Maybe that's a better way to ask it. Can a kind of localism emerge out of this that will make communities more resilient to these sorts of events in the future? Well, um, you, you know, I, I think in, in terms of, of reimagining capitalism, uh, I, I th it starts with an idea of where we want to go. What, what kind of results would we like to see? And, uh, if, and I think this is a national dialogue that we need to have. But I think we can also have this dialogue in our states and in our local communities. And I think West Michigan is uniquely qualified to be able to have this kind of dialogue. What kinds of results do we want to have as a result of how we practice capitalism? We need to understand that. Do we want to have, uh, it, I mean, the, the current narratives are around the idea of minimal government intervention. And um, um, uh, on the other hand, absolutely, uh, you know, free market, uh, do whatever you want to do with your business. And I, and I think that those are probably extremes that, that, that uh, rationally we should, we should consider how not to have that. I think the idea of, of reimagining capitalism in a way in which we have a race to the top, where those folks who are, are rewarded are rewarded in their businesses, not necessarily because the government is, is giving them a, a reward in some sort of financial package or something, but in how they practice their businesses the consumer rewards them because the consumer wants to associate with that kind of an organization. And the race to the top is, I, I think, is, uh, starts with having the dialogue locally, understanding what we expect from business, understand how business can be practiced, and understanding how we can do that. And then letting that inform the various uh, other parts of the country. And, and I think that that is a, a, the, the potential for the future. If we, if we get together as business leaders and think about what's good for our community, we'll understand best about what's good for the country. Thank you, Fred. Jerry, you get the last word if you like. All right. I do have to give a thumbs up for what Fred was just saying. Uh, there are so many things that have come out of this pandemic that show that people uh, basically have humane instincts. They want to help their neighbors. They want to reach out. Um, if, if I got asked for charity support for a friend whose family got flooded out of Midland, of course I'm going to give to that person. And I feel that um, this, is, this is one of those moments where people's better impulses are sort of bubbling to the surface. Um, and I think that what Fred said is exactly right. A lot of this takes place at a local level where you can see the impact, where you can meet the people you're working with, you know, maybe meet the beneficiaries. And it's a small enough scale that you're able to do things uh, that have a tangible impact on your life and your community's life. I, I also, I think Fred is right that in many ways, Western Michigan is an exemplar of sector to work together. It's nice when you're able to see uh, that this that this uh, can and does work. And uh, so I always love being on panels with Fred because he just feels like such a moral anchor uh, for these things and has this this great credibility and uh, an ability to convene uh, sort of uh, 
uh, leaders and thinkers to think, how do we address these problems collectively? So, so I am a big fan of locavorism and uh, the, the capacity and the promise of sort of local control that is collective. Well, thank you both very much for lending your, your time and your insights to this conversation. Can I invite people to contact you, respective organizations, if they so like? Most Absolutely. definitely. And wish you a good day.